the man, yeah, I said it Killed the bear, bear hand it so the people won't forget it ha. Getting money for our really label nice. to drink I don't care what a broke nigga think like Look, everything I do so call I can do this, both eyes closed Too short, I stay on my toes About that white boy, anything goes Help the bear if we are sad Help the bear if we are sad Still tipping, baby, nothing changed Still grinding over here, yeah Still sliding through my own lane There's already nothing funny over here Dallas rain everywhere around me Dream to get money Made it through the storm, living sunny Dreams came true, now we eating I got more dreams to chase, gotta reach them uh, Trying to put a team together like the Hunger Games Everybody grind together, we all came from hunger yeah, late ill kids at one yo so hold it down, bring you that street geek and nerd. So what is up, my people? Today or oh, yeah, coming with another wonderful episode of that's right. You best believe it. I ain't telling you no lies. We back at lounging, y'all. We chilling. It's been a minute since we got into lounging. You know what it is. Twitter craziness, news, you know what I'm saying? Hip hop politics, all that jazz. You know what I'm saying? That's that's what we're doing. That's what we get into. You know what I mean? Twitter streets is crazy. The news streets is crazy, and sometimes you got to talk about it. So, I mean, I know y'all seen us on the audio side, but we back in video. And when I say we, I'm not by myself. Lady Lisa, say what's up. Hey, y'all. <laughs> you best believe it. We back up in here. Now, um, to get you guys started, if, if y'all didn't know, lounging, you know, we do Twitter topics, trending, news, all that jazz. So, if, if you down for that. Feel free, go on and hit that like button, subscribe, share, all that jazz. Let's chill and uh, let you know that today we actually have a guest coming through, Alec Caracasanis. Um, this is a gentleman that we saw on um, a KTLA. news... Yeah, on KTLA, and we have him coming in right now. So without further ado, I'm going to let him slide through so everybody can see, see his sunshiny face. Uh, <laughs> in just a moment. Uh, so, shouts out to everyone who's coming in early in the chat. Shouts out to anybody who's coming back through on the replay. Uh, but it's good to see y'all come through. We're gonna have a cool conversation, and you know, see see what see what we can get into. See what we can uncover. See what we can talk about. All right. So, um, we got Alec coming through in just a second, and Lisa, I'll I'll, I'll throw it to you, Lisa. Um, mm -hmm. Since we since we saw this report on KTLA, uh, what kind of stood out to you as far as Alec was concerned, like the conversation that was being had with, um, uh, I cannot remember the reporter's name right now on KTLA 5. Yeah, we watch them all the time, but I can never remember their name. <laughs> you know, what stood out to me most was just he, he was very, um, he was just very straightforward with with his information it wasn't um it didn't seem biased you know mm -hmm. in any way it didn't seem okay. like uh you know based on some sort of agenda it's like the, these are the facts this is this is kind of you know what it is and the the fact that he was uh you know talking about things that that do affect the majority of people you know we are here in la Right. And so we when they talk about all these different, uh, you know, things that happen on the news, we know where they're talking about and we know what they're talking about. But, you know, all the time we kind of look at each other like, OK, you know, like, all right, <laughs> this is this is big news, um, you know, with the whole, you know, even smash and grab thing. It's like, well, if you want to really be honest about that, that's a Beverly Hills issue. If you really want to be honest. That. If you were somewhere else, we say this all the time. When our family in Virginia listens, you know, to the news or hears news about what's going on in California, they think all of LA is on fire. You know, when they talk about the news, <laughs> or they, you know, they think that all of LA is involved in this huge mudslide because yeah. you're in another state listening to the news about California, you, they make it seem like all of LA is going to implode, but it, there are these areas. And so 
we know when they talk about the smash and grab, that's a Beverly Hills issue. Let's just be real. That's True. Beverly, we're, we're here, we see this. And so that's happening in Beverly Hills, but then they wanna make it seem like there's this huge citywide issue of smash and grab that is just tearing the economy apart. No, it's it's not. I, it's, now, it's hold not. up, hold up real quick. We got Alec coming through, he's here. Uh, first, I wanna say hi, thank you for uh, you know taking the time to come through. Um, and I want to take a shot at this. Alec Caracasanis. That was great. Yeah! <laughs> That's right, y'all. We here. I practiced that name, like, all night. I was like, look, I got this. <laughs> so, uh, we gave you guys a little, in a, a little intro to kind of, like, our thoughts on him. But if you could, sir, go in and uh, tell people who you are, what you do. Yeah, sure. Thanks so much for having me. It's great to be here. Um, I'm a civil rights lawyer uh, based in Washington, D.C., but we work all over the country. Um, so I think I was asked to be involved a little bit in some of the discussions in Los Angeles because um, I was the civil rights lawyer who represented Kenneth Humphrey in the case that struck down the cash bail system in California last year. And for the last six or seven years, we've been working um, with people and families and um and communities and nonprofit organizations and public defenders and others across California to try to establish a really basic principle. And that is that no human being should be separated from their kids and put in a cage before being convicted of anything just because they can't pay cash. And that work mm. is, is similar to what we do all over the country, whether it's Louisiana or Texas or Illinois, um, Oklahoma or Tennessee or all the states that we work in, but we're really establishing some really basic principles. Um, our legal system treats poor people uh, with a level of incredible brutality um, and violence um, in a way that violates very basic human and civil rights. And so our work across the country, whether it's lawsuits challenging the cash bail system or lawsuits challenging the debtor's prison in Ferguson, Missouri, or lawsuits challenging um, police misconduct, prosecutor misconduct, um, judicial misconduct, we are, are, are really fighting for people who are the most vulnerable people in our society and whose bodies and lives and minds and families are, are threatened by the way in which the giant criminal punishment bureaucracy that arrests 11 million people a year um, by the way that bureaucracy treats them. And, and so our work okay. at Civil Rights Corps is really about changing how our society thinks about this system of mass human caging. All right. Now, the video, uh, I found the title, uh, Lisa and I, uh, Lady Lisa, my wife, she's on the line as well. But, um, Good morning. <laughs> uh, Good morning. So uh, the video that we saw, the title, so if you're watching, you can check the title uh, and find it on YouTube. It says, former public defender asks, does, crime, uh, does the crime that does the most harm get the most media attention? So that's what we saw you first on. And you elaborated a lot about... Um, Things like wage theft, things like, uh, you know, like wage fixing, things like uh, people kind of like uh, speculating on currency uh, in very high 1%, I guess, type places, as opposed to um, as opposed to things like smash and grabs and or uh, what is kind of termed crime and what does the most harm, like, you know, you brought up Flint things of that nature and if you could because it seemed like the the show kind of you know of course the ktla has to move on if you could uh give us a little you know uh, expand on that point a little bit about like crime and i guess what i would consider like real crime and how it plays out in our media and also in our social in the real yeah i mean one thing you have to understand right up front about the criminal punishment system in this country is police prosecutors and judges they only enforce some laws against some people some of the time and mm -hmm. they typically choose to enforce those laws against poor people people of color throughout this country's history disproportionately choosing to enforce them against black people and immigrants um particularly immigrants of color um so for example you know it's a it's technically a crime for two students to get into a fight at a school. But if your school is in a poor neighborhood, a predominantly black neighborhood, where there's police in your school, 
they arrest the kids, they record it as a crime, they sometimes take the kids away from their family, and they put them into what they call the juvenile justice system. Um, if you, that happens at a rich school, maybe the kid's parents get called, they go to the principal's office. One of those incidents is recorded as a crime, one of them is never recorded as a crime. The same is true with, with gambling. Like if you're poor people and you're gambling in the streets over dice, that's an illegal crime. The police come, they arrest you, they take your cash off you. But if you're a rich person, you go to a casino or you gamble over international currency or you gamble over the global price of wheat. Um, one of those crimes actually causes a lot of harm. And in fact, whole economies and massive um, plagues of starvation have actually been caused by speculation of uh, on the price of wheat or corn or things like that. So that's just gambling, both of them, right? But rich people um, have created certain fora where they can gamble. But it gets even more deeper than that, right? So look at LA County, for example. There are tens of millions of dollars in wage theft every year by employers. That's a crime. Nobody pays attention to it. Um, finally, the LA sheriff announced he was going to embark on some kind of $26 million plan to like tackle wage theft in LA. After a year, do you know what they had recovered for workers? $450, according oh to LA. <laughs> um, now, I'm, sorry. Time, I'm but, not laughing because of, it's funny. I'm laughing because so ridiculous. it's sad. It's, it's so ridiculous. Yeah, they're just, oh, sorry, Lisa, go ahead. No, I was just saying, you know, yeah, he's, I know he's laughing because it's so ridiculous. All you can really do is laugh, you know, because it's just, it's so utterly ridiculous. You know, the, the resources that they have to, to do this work and the little bit of work that they do. And then they'll just want, you know, brush their hands off and want to be congratulated for, for doing the little bit oh, of work. Oh, they're going to pat themselves on the back. They're going to do that. <laughs> it's even worse than that, though, because, you know, the amount of wage theft in L.A. and across the country dwarfs all of the other property crimes combined, it dwarfs robbery and larceny and burglary and shoplifting. Um, and, and the people that are being stolen from aren't big corporations who have billions of dollars, right? Um, or aren't small businesses um, um, who make several hundred thousand dollars a year. These are the poorest people in our society, frontline workers. Um, many of them are undocumented. Um, their employers, whether they're construction companies or some of these same chain stores or restaurants or whatever they're stealing their wages and that's a crime and it's just completely unenforced in the society and and estimates at the conservative end are that this is about 50 billion dollars a year in stolen wages from the poorest people in our society but it gets even worse the amount of tax evasion in this country is 20 times more than that the rich people are stealing a trillion dollars a year in taxes that dwarfs by a factor of about a hundred all this other burglary robbery um, these, these crimes that police focus on and the elite people who control our criminal legal system, they just choose hardly ever to look at or enforce or even investigate tax evasion. That's a deliberate choice about which crimes we're going to enforce and which crimes we're not. Yeah. And, and one thing I, I noticed, you know, just in, in listening to you when you were on KTLA and even now, it seems like everything comes back to these large corporations. So is, is that something um, in your field of law that you kind of get into, or is that something more that like maybe a, a corporate lawyer would get into, like, you know, talking about how these corporations have such a big hand and control and what's being reported and, and, and what's being done? Yeah, I mean, it, in every area of our society, whether it's uh, environmental policy, and by the way, um, large corporations are committing hundreds of thousands of environmental crimes every year, dumping toxic chemicals in water, um, violating air pollution regulation. Um, I think it, it's important to point out that because LA is a really great example of this, 100,000 people die every year in this country from air pollution alone. That's five times the number of all murders in this country because of yeah. air pollution. Um, wow. But large corporations don't want us talking about air pollution crimes. Um, they also control the healthcare uh, conversation. They control the policing conversation. They are heavily invested in a society that is focused on the crimes of the poor and not the crimes of the rich. And because they also own and control most of the media outlets that are giving us this information, there's a real bias in favor of telling the public about these urgent crimes of the poor, making everyone fear shoplifting from CVS or Walgreens rather than hearing wage theft of their wages. I mean, it, it's a 
or rather than fearing illegal eviction by their landlord. I mean, these are deliberate choices that are being made. Yeah. And is that something is, in terms of those regulations, is, is, isn't that something that Congress itself uh, controls? These kinds of things are controlled at every level of government, local government. Um, you know, it, it's really the local governments that are making the decisions about where to deploy police, what crimes to investigate, what crimes to prosecute. These are local mayors, local county governments, um, local sheriffs, um, local police departments. Um, they really control the system of mass incarceration in this country, the system that now has led Black people to be caged at six times the rate of South Africa at the height of apartheid. That's mostly local decision making, but they're controlled in really big ways through the way that federal dollars are spent. So, for example, the federal government will send billions of dollars a, a year to police departments. And they're not sending those billions of dollars a year so that police can investigate wage theft or tax evasion. <laughs> they're sending that money so they can arrest poor people for drugs. Yeah. So they can arrest homeless <laughs> people for trespass. Yeah. Now, now that's, uh, I wanted to uh, bring up that point because uh, the two points, uh, because here, of course, we're black. We cover anti-blackness. We cover news from a perspective of being black in America. Um, now, we live in L.A. That's why we saw you on KTLA. But you brought up the point of black people being jailed. I believe you said six times that um, at, the, at the rate of the height of the uh, South African apartheid. And uh, you spoke about um, marijuana arrests being, I forgot the number, like it, dwarfing some number of like other arrests. And um, I wanted to bring that up and also frame how currently in New York, you got, um, I forgot that guy's name, is it Eric? What is the, the mayor, the new mayor? Okay. Anyway. Eric Adams. Eric Adams. So anyway, uh, he's like, oh, well, we're going to have a neighborhood task force. And I want to be honest, black people like, stop and frisk. <laughs> because yeah, it sounds like stop and frisk. It. And yeah. they came out and they were like, oh, we we arrested all these people. And guess what? All these people, most of them had previous arrests. And we were like, well, yeah, because you arrest. <laughs> Just because you're arrested doesn't mean you did anything wrong, particularly. Arresting means an officer put cuffs on you and took you to the station. That's all arrest means on its, on its surface. But if you could uh, kind of give us some insight to sort of how you look at arrests, how you look at uh, jailing in general uh, from your perspective and from the perspective, I guess, of like the larger organization that you work with. Yeah, I think we have to understand that this system of arresting is a hugely profitable and beneficial business for certain interests in our society. So there are about 11 million people every year who, who are arrested, which, which means, and let's be very clear, they have metal chains put on their bodies. Um, they're taken away from their school and their job and their family and their children, and their loved ones, and their educational opportunities, their medical care, right? They're put into a cage um, where they don't get fresh air. They don't get sunlight. They don't get nutritious food. They're likely to get an infectious disease. They're very, very high risk of being sexually or physically assaulted. That's what arrest means. So like when people talk about arrest, we need to be very, very clear. We're talking about like to the government choosing to do something that's very brutal to someone's body. Now, if you look at uh, most of the 21st century in the US, um, in many, many of those years, this country's leaders have decided to arrest more people for marijuana possession than all violent crime combined. Now, what does that tell you about the interests and goals and um, sort of background um, policy perspective of the people that are making these decisions? They would rather arrest and cage for and Keep in mind, they're not arresting like Yale and Harvard students for marijuana <laughs> possession, yeah. right? They're not arresting like Democrat or Republican uh, state legislators or the children of of you know, billionaires, right? They are arresting very poor people for possession of marijuana. Yeah. And they're choosing to do that rather than investigate sexual assault. For example, many of these same departments have a total of several hundred thousand untested rape kits. These are rape kits, they're just not even tested. 
understand. Yeah. You have to understand this is all is what I what I really get at in my book, Usual Cruelty, is I try to explain exactly why all these decisions are being made. Um, because it's a very important thing to understand that these systems do not care about your safety. They care about something else. They care about control. They care about profit. They care about constantly increasing their own stuff. All right, uh, Lisa, did you have? Um, yeah, I had a question. I was just thinking about um, what is what is your um, perspective on how this relates to the school to prison pipeline? The school to prison pipeline, you know, represents sort of the the youth wing of this mass human staging movement, and what they realized was that. Um, they could militarize um, police in schools. They could control young people, particularly young poor people, people of color from a very early age, trap them in a cycle of control and poverty and veiling. Um, and this was a very effective way of controlling, uh, uh, you know, a labor force, a potential uh, source of people who could get politically active and radicalized. Right? Um, it's a very uh, important way of controlling their parents as um, constantly keeping these families sort of in the in, in crisis um, but it's a way of like um, preventing our society from really confronting really deep difficult questions like um, what would it look like to have actually well-funded um, schools that are sites of care and learning and the arts and music and theater and poetry and rather than like um, investing in, uh, because these would be pretty significant investments to actually make sure that every child in this country had a safe place to live and flourish and learn. Um, the corporations and unions and sort of bureaucratic interests that run the criminal punishment bureaucracy realize that all of those investments would be a huge threat to their own power. Because one of the things that we know from the scientific literature is if you actually invest in kids and give them places to hang out and to play and to have the care that they need and safe places to live um, and you expose them to music and theater and art and comic books and 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 all these other things right if you expose them to nature um, they actually um, uh, thrive and it's not I mean it's, it's it's obviously common sense but we have a very very profitable sector of our society that doesn't want that to happen because their own power and control and profit are, are tied up in keeping as many people as possible coming into the criminal punishment bureaucracy. Yeah. And um, I'm sorry, did you have a question? Because I, I had- No, 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 go ahead. Go ahead. Okay. Um, so I know that, um, you know, during the pandemic, a lot of Black families in particular have started pulling their, cool, their kids out of public schools and homeschooling. That's something that's become very huge. That's something we are doing with our child. And I've joined different groups and they've, you know, had this conversation. Do you see that as making a significant difference specifically for Black people and maybe even other families of color that, that choose to do that? I mean, I think one of the most important things that could happen is a movement of families um, who say, we want a really different, um, we want to create a really different place for our children to learn. Um, a place that's free from the violence and the discipline and the divestment um, of the typical public school system. Um, so, I mean, I, I'm not an expert on this issue and I know there's there's pretty big disagreements um, in th those communities about like what the most effective strategy is. You know, should we organize and take over the school board like a lot of the white right ringers are trying to do? Should we get out of that system altogether and start our own freedom community school? Um, there are lots of people having this debate and I think like what's most important is that people understand that like the public education system has traditionally been a place for like producing workers for a capitalist society, right. not for producing critical thinkers, not for producing people who are connected to each other, um, who have values of, of community and solidarity, right? It's a, it's a place of competition and control. Um, and so I think, Either way you do it, and there are really amazing people I know doing different types of interventions in the public school system. Um, you know, it, it understanding the, the the core problem and organizing with other people and families is like a really inspiring and amazing thing that's, that's happening all over the country. 
Yeah. And I, you know, I ask about it because just kind of like what you, you touched on to me, it's sort of like a, a starter kit, you know, for black kids of how you're going to be treated. You know what I mean? They, the, the over discipline and the extreme discipline, the mistreatment from the teachers, the, the not stepping in when, you know, kids are being abused, the, you know, choices of, um, you know, placing black kids in, in classes saying they don't, they don't perform as well. All of, all of these different things to me, it's like, you know, a starter kit of, you know, just to let you know, this is how you're going to be treated, you know, once you get out. And so we want you to go ahead and get used to this treatment because, you know, we're, we're bringing you up to, to go right into the system. So. Yeah. yeah. And I forgot, can't remember the statistic. It wasn't, we weren't going over labor statistics. I can't remember who brought it up and I wish I had the link with me because I didn't think we were going to go this way, but uh, they were talking about the rate at which uh, black boys were being suspended, expelled, uh, yeah. detention, all that from school as opposed to every single other group. And, um, you know, we, we see video after video of like, you know, kids getting beat up or ridiculed or, you know, slurs written on their locker or whatever. Kids handcuffed. Yes. Um, so then, uh, you know, during the pandemic, a lot of parents were like, hey, well, we're kind of at home anyway. Let's go in and keep on doing it. And I didn't think it was going to catch on. But then I believe we saw a story on like MSNBC or something. And I was like, oh, okay. So this is a bigger thing than even we thought it was. Yeah. And it kind of, it kind of speaks to this kind of idea of people mobilizing and doing for themselves, even like on kind of like on the, uh, on the side of the corporations where like wage theft or even wage fixing, uh, because that's something else that happens where it's kind of wage fixing is kind of tied to wage theft in a way where... I, 2016, I'm probably wrong, but Disney, Pixar, and a whole bunch of them got caught, DreamWorks got caught fixing animators, uh, wage fixing animators' wages, um, because that's, they, they run the, they run the gamut. Who else you gonna work for? So, but I remember that being a story, I remember a couple of articles, and then, hush. And then it kind of goes back to the statement that you were talking about, like, well, they, they kind of lobby, they have media companies and things like that. Um, and it's kind of like, well, what's the conversation going to be? You know, the conversation is going to be what we want. Even when um, Disney had their kind of like tiff with um, uh, the LA Times, it would have gone down exactly how Disney said, like, you ain't allowed to none of our you know, previews anymore, unless Boston Globe and New York Times and everybody else stood up and said, no, Disney, you ain't going to treat LA Times like this. So it is kind of like this thing where people have to unfortunately continually fix the problems of people with power because people, grown people just won't do right. <laughs> um, so uh on uh i have uh on to you when you when you think about these questions of what i would consider or think about these issues of what i would consider real crime um what are some of the pathways that you guys are kind of like taking to create equity create equality uh you know what are you know what are the pathways that you're doing to like mobilize to you know make people realize that hey yes you know you are the little guy but you aren't essentially powerless? That's such a good question. I mean, I think um, the most important thing is not what the work that we do as lawyers. That's actually relatively unimportant because courts are, are never the place where social change is going to happen. Courts are like a powerful institution that has been run by elite people. Um, the most we can do with courts is help draw attention and shine a light on the incredible ways in which our society is failing to live up to its own values. Mm. Um, but what's really important is the organizing work that's done outside of court by people who are most directly impacted by these systems, by people and families who've been incarcerated, who've been surveilled, who've been targeted by police, who've been harassed, beaten, um, by people who've been illegally evicted, by people who, who've had their wages stolen by their employer. These are all people who have the power and it can feel really, um, you know, when any of us has been, been in a situation where we've been fighting against something really powerful in our lives, it can feel really isolating and really 
hard, especially when you know the inequality in our society is so significant. But it starts to feel more possible when you come together with other people. That's why coming together is just so important. So like in Los Angeles, like the people that came together and organized the Justice LA Coalition, all the amazing groups that came together, the Youth Justice Org, the Dignity and Power Now, La Defensa, SE Justice Group, all these groups in LA who, who each represent different bases, who, diff- who have different, um, and there's many more. I was just giving a couple of examples. Um, it's only by coming together and organizing with each other in your neighborhood, on your block, um, at your school, um, that, that, you know, one bad thing happening to one person becomes like a shared story and a shared fight. And that's when you actually have power to do things like um, pass um, uh, ballot measures in LA County that force the county to divest, like Measure J, from police, probation, jails, um, and into things that actually help communities thrive and care. And so I would just urge people to like, um, figure out what kind of mutual aid is happening in your neighborhood, getting together with other people, um, what kind of organizations are fighting against these systems in LA, um, and who, who is organizing them and, and to try to get involved, you know, if you're in LA. And the same is true everywhere else, right? Everywhere we go, there are amazing, inspiring organizers who are bringing people together to fight against these things, not as, you know, one individual versus Goliath, but as mm. a group of people who, who have a lot more power together. Yeah, and okay, because we have seen, especially since 2020, um, unfortunately, with the, with the events, the horrible events that happened to George Floyd, we have seen a lot of uprisings. And the reason I use I use uprisings instead of the term that you know normal people, normal powered people want to use to kind of scare folks, um, because I've said this many times before. If you look at throughout history, if people have to fix the problem things burn, no matter where, no matter where, no matter what time in history, you can even go back to the, you know, the, the, the Boston Tea Party. When people have to fix a problem, instead of the government fixing the problem, usually things burn. But since that, we have seen some, we've seen some movement, we've seen some change, we've seen some, uh, some, some different conversations come up. And most recently, Lisa and I saw a story in Atlanta where there was a man on uh, the the Metro Transit with a gun. And the police actually were um, uh, accompanied by a mental health physician or something. I don't want to mess up their name, psychiatrist, therapist, something like that. But normally, black guy with a gun in public equals dead. But today, and I know it's baby steps, y'all. Hey, you know, baby steps. But they were able to, you know, the therapist person, you know what I'm saying, was able to like talk and eject, bring them down. And the guy was arrested and the guy's still alive. And, you know, they found out that this guy had, you know, issues and things was going on in his life and all of that stuff. And, you know, no one was shot. No one died. And, you know, it's it's, so we are seeing slight changes in how policing is done. Now, of course, we also just had a state of the union. (laughs) Like, I don't give them more money. (laughs) But, but, um, there are, we do see conversations changing around policing. Um, what, are your, what are your thoughts on even small things or small ways policing can change or mentality around policing? Because some people like myself think not only defund the police, but we need to like reset. Like everyone needs to be fired. We need to rehire everyone from the start because like y'all don't know how to act. Like we've seen y'all Facebook groups, we've seen y'all text chats. Like it's not just two of y'all. Like, but what are your the culture, thoughts? The culture needs to burn first. You know, yeah. it's a culture thing. So the culture itself has to burn first and then rebuild. And and but yeah. But uh, how do you see, or what are some things that you've even thought about? Like, hey, what if we did something like this? Or what are we like wh- from your perspective? What are some things that have changed or probably could change more? with what we're kind of working with now, fighting for now, marching for now, voting for now, um, to change kind of like police and policing? I think it's really important to understand, this is really what my book is about. Um, I think it's important to understand that virtually everything that is sold to us as a reform, you know, so-called reform, is 
actually an attempt by the people who are controlling the system to preserve all of the same behavior and outcome with a different label. Um, mm -hmm. So let me just say right away, the police killed more people in 2021 than they did in 2020. So after all those uprisings, Breonna Taylor, George Floyd, police killed more people the next year. Wow. Let me also say, um, you know, let's take the example of the police body camera, which was touted as a huge reform. Um, the body camera came into being um, in large part um, in terms of the funding for it after Michael Brown was murdered. People were saying, well, we don't know what happened. Yeah. There was no body camera. We need we need to see what happened, right? Um, so President Obama and lots of uh, very powerful corporate and police officials got together and they said, well, let's make sure we get body cameras everywhere. So they gave hundreds of millions of dollars from federal money to get body cameras. Now, here's something you have to understand. For many years, police wanted body cameras. They wanted them because body cameras are the best surveillance tool you can imagine. They are a camera, a surveillance camera on every cop in the country that they control. They turn on and off. It looks outward. It doesn't look inward at them. It looks outward, yeah. right? They point it wherever they want to point it. Um, they can withhold it whenever they want to withhold it. But if it shows something good for them, they can release it to the public within 10 minutes, right? <laughs> um, and here's the key point. They had a plan for years to link all of these cameras the very sophisticated, very expensive new cloud computing, facial recognition and audio recognition, voice recognition, of course. software databases from Palantir and Amazon and Microsoft. And so the police had a problem, though. They couldn't get the billions of dollars they needed to have every cop in the country have this sophisticated technology. So what did they do? They they essentially they worked with complicit politicians, but they tricked a lot of liberal progressive people around the country. They tricked them into thinking that the body camera was a reform. They used their own violence to get the very technology that they couldn't get us to pay for otherwise. And that's how I think of almost all of the things that are sold to us as police reform. Um, the, the number one thing we need to do is reduce the size and power of police departments. We need to reduce their budget. We need to reduce their political power. We need to reduce the power of a police union. And then we need to take those resources and invest them in the things that the scientific evidence actually shows work. Um, and that's not hard. Like we know that like people having a place to live and a job and a good school and medical care, we know that those things actually are what makes communities safe, not armed bureaucrats with surveillance cameras and guns. And, wow. and, and the, the way they sell it or the way they, the way they tell us like, Hey, we don't have money for that. Like, like you can eat it, like you said, you know, uh, safe schools, uh, health care, you know what I'm saying, good job, safe area, stuff like that. They'll be like, well, you know, we can, we don't have the money for all that. You know, we don't, we don't have the money for that. We, we don't. And uh, I liken it to when I was younger. When I was young, shouts out to my mom. If I had $5 that my mom didn't know about, she wanted to know where it came from. Where, where you get that money? Now, on the, split, on, the, on the other side, the government says we don't have any money. We don't have any money, we're broke. There's nothing there. Then, boom, Afghanistan happens. We got tons of money. Boom, Ukraine happens. We got tons of money. And we're like, hey, you told us <laughs> you didn't have no money. <laughs> you told us we asked for universal health care. You said you was broke. You said, hey, I'm going to pay student debt. Then you said you was broke. You said you was going to do all these things. Then you was broke. Now, all of a sudden, you got billions of dollars? Huh? Yeah. So, Think about... Think about, you know, like in our hometown, you know, we're, we're from Richmond, Virginia, and there are, you know, schools that have, you know, have not have any, any type of work done on it for decades. And there's one school in particular, George Worth High School, that's um, in, in the city. And there was a gentleman who came on the news because we watch our news from our hometown also. And he said he graduated from there in 1972 and the building today looks the same as it did when he graduated in 1972. And there's a fight about funding for this school. But then they just were pushing building all these casinos in the same city. So it's like... Uh, it, the, and they're the, actually holding uh, up 70 something million for yeah. rebuilding a school, but they don't... Apparently the idea from the school board in that area is they don't like 
the plans for building right. that school. Right. So now... and it's the hypocrisy of it in the, you know, what they deem as important is just, it's actually disgusting. Oh, you know, honestly, a lot of times, because we're talking about a, a school that's at this point really run down, you know, pretty, pretty dangerous. And the hypocrisy of it all is just, you know, it gets really disgusting. And I know usually in areas, um, usually in white areas, you have these families where they can, they have the time, you know, to go to these school board meetings, you know, they have the, the time and the resources to do, do that. But then when you go in the inner city, you have parents that are working maybe two, three jobs. They're not able to go to these school board meetings and, and really voice, you know, what it is they want to voice. And so they, I feel they take advantage of that. And they said, there's nothing that, that, you know, you can do. We can kind of do what we want to. Either you're going to get a new school or you're not, depending on what we say. And if we say that there's going to be a new casino built, because that's the priority, that's what we're going to do also in this city. Which they actually voted down like a year or two ago. They voted down. And now down. they're circling they back. Oh, we're well, going to get know, our we, casino. We want to vote again because maybe some people didn't get to vote. No, maybe you're going to get us to keep voting until we say yes. But So, yeah. um... To, to frame this in, in that particular place. All right, so Richmond, Virginia. Um, Richmond, Virginia, of course, inner city. Chesterfield County is right outside of uh, Richmond, Virginia. Since I've graduated, I graduated in the year 2000. Since I've graduated, they've built two new high schools, at least that I know of. There might be a third in one Chesterfield. in Chesterfield County. Yes, in Chesterfield County. In Richmond City, they haven't... George Wythe is sitting there since 1972. Same old building. And they're complaining about they don't like the plans. Now, a new school burned down on accident. It wasn't nobody, you know, it burned down, you know, uh, Fox Hill School, it burned down. Well, it wasn't immediately. new. Immediately. Fox, Fox wasn't new. Oh, okay. Well, well sorry. It wasn't but it's new. A predominant, but it, it's a I mean, predominant it, white school. It burned down recently, sorry. So, it burned down recently, but it's in a very high society type neighborhood in that city. Immediately, they're talking about building it back. Immediately. Yeah. <laughs> immediately. <laughs> it's got we got to get bricks out today. <laughs> so yeah. it's it's like people in the same city were like, whoa, hold up, hold up. Oh, we've been asking to build, and y'all actually got the money. Y'all are just holding it from us. But we got the, we've been asking to fix this school. And then somehow th now the conversation is about this school to be built. And it kind of goes back to how the system kind of is picking winners and losers. Um, to tie that into uh, my next question, how, when you see the system playing out winners and losers, do you feel like there's a, do you ever get the sense of like, hey, we're gaining ground? Or do you get the sense like, we're just treading water? Like we're just on the treadmill? You know, is there, is there any sense of like, all right, we're, we're inching ahead? You know, how how are you seeing things play out, I guess, socially and also governmentally? I mean, that's a really hard question, and I don't pretend to have an answer to it. It's very, very difficult. Um, I would just say on in different ways, sometimes, you know, it feels like this exchange. There's sometimes there's moving forward and sometimes there's moving backward and sometimes like we're moving forward on some things and backward and other things. But in general, I'm very scared about where we are right now. Um, yeah. I have never seen uh, in my time, um, my 15 years working in this system, I've never seen um, this kind of media rhetoric around um, sort of a reactionary right wing, authoritarian sort of pro-police kind of conceptualization of what safety means. Mm -hmm. um, we have a very, very, very worrying um, ecological imminent catastrophe happening around the world with, with pollution and global warming and all the migration and and sort of uh, like stresses that are going to be put on things like immigration systems. And we also have massive technological corporate and governmental investment in systems of brutality, control, surveillance, um, we have unprecedented consolidation of the media of like uh, of sort of like all of our our economy in different sectors. We have more and more monopolies, more and more inequality than we've had 
um, in generations. We have all these trends that are very, very, very worrying. And I think what's exciting is that there does seem to be a growing movement of younger people who understand the importance of organizing, who are developing a deeper uh, analysis about how these systems are, are, are racist and how these systems are based on sort of poor economic exploitation. Um, mm -hmm. But unless we harness that, unless we, um, and I should just say, we have a very, in this country and in other countries like India and um, in Eastern Europe and Brazil, the very, very powerful right-wing fascist movement. They are organizing. They are very, very scary. Um, they are preparing for, um, you know, an overt level of fascism that we have never seen in our lifetime in this country and abroad. So we've got our work cut out for us. Um, as we have there's some positive yeah. things happening, but also we're in a very scary time. Okay, and Alec, well, I know, I know okay. you're going to have to go really soon, but I just wanted to um, actually personally tell you thank you for the work that you do. Um, because when we as Black people seem to, you know, bring light to what our issues are, when poor people bring issues to what, you know, bring light to what their issues are, we're kind of looked at it as, oh, you're just complaining, just work harder. But when someone outside of our group brings light to it, you know, that's when, you know, someone pays attention. So thank you, honestly, for, for the work that you do. Yeah. That, thank you uh, so much for having me on. Yes. Uh, so, guys, thank you for coming through. Alec, you know, we've had him too long. All right. He's busy. He has things to do. He's out there doing things. All right. And he's in D.C. He can't drive nowhere. They just fixed the mixing bowl. <laughs> They're going to work on the mixing bowl again. So, oh, and I forgot, if you're here in L.A. watching, you don't know what the mixing bowl is. But just, it's bad. You don't want to be on it. So, uh, Alec, uh, <laughs> thank you for coming through. Tell people where they can find you, and we will see you someday. <laughs> yeah, you can find me at Equality Alec on Twitter. Um, and also, you can check out my book. Um, all the proceeds from the book go to an amazing California-based organization that organizes women with incarcerated loved ones. The book is called Usual Cruelty. So, thank you so much, guys. Thank, thank you. you. Thank have a you. great day. All right, have a good one. <laughs> So, guys, that's what's up. Like, we had a chance to get him to talk, to expand on his points, uh, because the the quick KTLA video was, it didn't really, uh, the quick KTLA video didn't seem to get his full point, his ideas and thoughts out. And I'm glad we had a chance to uh, talk to him. So, uh, uh, Lady Lisa, do you have any final thoughts? Um. I just think he's a fascinating person. Honestly, I, I, you know, love how he's just very straightforward. And, uh, you know, like I said before, and he doesn't seem to have regard for what this group may think or what that group may think. He's just like, this is what it is. So I, I like that um, about him. And I look forward to reading his book and um, checking out some more of, you know, um, some of the things that he does. <laughs> yeah. Now, shouts to Therese in the chat. He said, hold up. I just got here. Y'all leaving. <laughs> I don't know when y'all are going to learn. We don't Yo. operate on CP time on this Yo, channel. Man, look. All right, check it, Therese. All right, so, Therese, I know, because I, I, I understand. Streaming culture, <laughs> people be online for, like, three, four hours, six hours, but I'm not your average streamer. Most streamers are a little bit younger than me. I'm OG status. I'm, I'm uncle status now, you know what I'm saying? I'm walking into my unclehood. You know what I'm saying? So, you know, I got a wife. I got a little kid. I can't be on stream all day. Now, <laughs> I will be on stream at noon PST. We're going to be talking about Halo. But then that's going to be it. That's it for the day. Then tomorrow we'll talk about Picard and all that. And, you know, we're going to holler at y'all about Fresh Prince. I mean, about, about uh, Bel Air, not Fresh Prince. <laughs> we done talked about Fresh Prince. Um, but I do think um, there are... He... he for someone who's working in the space, um, to be seeing the unsettling trends that we're seeing. Because yes, there is this movement globally around a very right-wing kind of police state -y kind of energy that is can be scary if we watch it play out, if we if we let it play out. Um, and it doesn't to a certain degree, it seems like hey, uh, this kind of sort of 
fascist authoritarian energy. Oh, it's only a couple of people. But even if it seems to only be a couple of people or, you know, a, a small amount, they seem to, they tend to be people that have a little bit more power. So even though it might be less people on the, on the population scale, they have the power to kind of like wield and tip those scales. Um, so yeah, the, it, it was interesting to see that he he was seeing those signs because we've been seeing them. We you know like we've been seeing them. Shouts to Thought Crimes, they've been seeing them. You know what I'm saying? You know any any number of channels that kind of like even follow the news in like a like a, a very kind of laid back or or even like slight way are kind of noticing these things. Like you know. I don't know, Phil on uh, African Diaspora News Channel or something like that. Yeah. You know, he's seeing these things. He's mentioned these things before. Uh, you know, even even on the side of uh, something like, I don't know, like Professor Black Truth or like Tariq Nasheed or something. And people are noticing these things. And I did, I, I will agree that I'm glad that we do have a new group of, you know, young people that are like willing to organized to kind of like speak about things to keep this conversation going instead of staying silent. Um, yeah. So I think that's because we're, we're at a, at a time where we have, I think we have the tools now to kind of, to keep a conversation going and kind of, kind of create topics of conversation instead of having those topics dictated to us. Mm -hmm. Um, so, you know, shouts out, shouts out to the youth on that, man. Shouts out to the youth that be out there in the streets. Shouts out to the youth that are doing demonstrations out their schools, whether it's walkouts, yeah. whether it's, you know, demonstrations in the cafeteria. Look, it's your school, just like it's everyone else's school. And, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. When you see an injustice going on, you know what I'm saying? Shouts to y'all for doing that. You know what I'm saying? I'm yeah. always going, I'm always going to look and, at that proudly. Yeah. And shouts to the parents to support them because that's Im yeah. important too. So, yeah. Yeah, it's like, look, when straight up, when y'all parents, look, you know, it's like, eh, yo, when, when y'all kids are done wrong, y'all need to be rolling up to the school like Malcolm rolled up to the jail. You know what I'm saying? Y'all need to be rolling in force. Like, we need to be getting all the parents. Now, of course, we understand. We understand there are things like, you know, schedules and work and, you know, you would live, you win the rat race. But we gotta we gotta find time to you know to protect our kids. We got to. Um, because they're the next generation, man. We gotta we gotta protect our kids. Ain't no way we get a we you know continue on our legacies without our children. You know what I'm saying? Um Therese says, never mind, I just checked. I did get it, but it's a silent notification. I'm gonna have to uh <laughs> go into my phone settings and set it to make an alert sound. See, see man, see YouTube, YouTube don't be Man, YouTube be messing things up. Then when it actually do come through, then T-Mobile messes it up. Now, I don't know if you got T-Mobile or not. I don't know. Maybe you got C-Mobile. You know what I'm saying? Oh, boy. Like, oh, C-Mobile. <laughs> but, uh, but uh, yeah, I I like I like that, you know, there is there is some youth that's ready to to fight that fight. And as long as we don't have people you know, looking down or talking down on that fight, like unfortunately Jesse Jackson has, you know, as in as long as we have, you know, the elders coming through, encouraging that fight, you know, bringing wisdom to that fight, then I think we'll see, you know, as in because it's like he said, we have our work cut out for us because there are many powered people, you know, out here, you know, all for that give, I mean, like, you know, Joe Biden just said, you know, he was going to fund, fund, fund the police. You know, he was going to make sure, you know, you heard that he was going to fund the police. Like, yeah. like, it's just, but I, like and, and, there's and ever I, been a time that they weren't funded. Like, yeah, and the, when, the, when's the, the last time the police had to, like, do a car wash to, like, come on, yeah. man. Yeah, and I love what, <laughs> what Alec, I love what Alec had, had, had said, is that if, if funding was the answer for, you know, us being kept safe and the police being able to do their quote job, then we would be the safest country there is. Yeah. But funding isn't the answer. You know, we've, yeah. like you said, we, you know, we've never heard of a, a police department having to have a, a fund, a bake sale or a yeah. car wash to raise money for more vets. They have all the funding they need. We've never, I mean, well, I don't recall hearing about a police force that 
uh, was under underfunded. <laughs> Right there. Do, do every time I dinners. turn around, every time I turn around, y'all got new cars. Every time I turn yeah. around, y'all got you know new cars, and they get closer and closer to being a Trans Am. You know, like what is, <laughs> <laughs> what is, what I take it back with that. But what is what is going on? You know, so that's that's not even you know the answer. But I don't know. He he just he said a whole lot. Um, and honestly, I, I I probably could sit here and talk to him for hours because he's just like this this plethora of of, of information and ideas and i i can't wait to read his book what up what up so guys thank you for rolling through thank you for chilling hanging with us shouts out to malcolm lee yes we be trying to do the lord's work we be trying man we try to stay prayed up you know what i'm saying because it's the god in me uh, oh <laughs> i love him like i do i you know what i'm saying it's like look all right gp gp are you with that you know what i'm saying so <laughs> Um, <laughs> but yeah, Therese said facts. They be having Hellcats and all. Yeah, they be having like the <laughs> Ill, they be having the he helicopters and all. That. Like, come on, man, stop. Like, you know, like you're like <laughs> police. Like, oh, we don't got no money. They got the freshest, brand new stuff. Like, they ain't doing so, nothing. Nothing. So, Lady Lisa, say peace. Bye, y'all. All right, guys. N e r d s u l. Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, TikTok, podcast, all that jazz. Make sure to hit the like button. Share this to someone who want to join the conversation, who wants to talk about, you know what I'm saying, real crime, who wants to talk about, you know, things that are actually affecting our societies, people that want to be in that conversation, period, and, you know what I'm saying, here in exchange of ideas, I'm down for all that. So, of course, from us to you, thank you for watching. We're going to leave y'all with some black comics. And until next time, peace. Mm, 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 uh, we out. <laughs>